Welcome everyone to the Apotheki Tales, the basics of pharmacology. Today we are going to talk about the Parkinson's disease or neurological condition. So Parkinsonism is a progressive neurological disorder of the muscle movement that is usually characterized by tremors, muscular rigidity, bradykinesia that is a slowness in initiating and carrying out the voluntary movements. Then we can observe postural and gait abnormalities. The exact cause of Parkinson's disease is usually unknown for most of the patients. Usually it is being correlated with destruction of dopaminergic neurons in the substantia nigra with the consequent reduction of dopamine actions in the corpus striatum and parts of basal ganglia system that are involved in the motor control. That means when there is a destruction of the dopaminergic neurons, mainly the motor control is being affected. So talking about the different uh, parts that is being affected in the Parkinson's disease, the substantia nigra is a part of the extrapyramidal system which is the source of the dopaminergic neurons that terminate in the neostriatum. Each dopaminergic neuron makes thousands of synaptic contacts within the neostriatum and therefore modulates the activity of a large number of cells. And these dopaminergic projections from the substantia nigra fire tonically rather than in response to specific muscular movements or sensory input. Thus, the dopaminergic system appears to serve as a tonic, sustaining influence on motor activity rather than participating in specific movements. And talking about the neostriatum, normally the neostriatum is connected to the substantia nigra by the neurons that secrete the inhibitory transmitter gamma at their terminal. And in turn, the cells of the substantia nigra send neurons back to the neostriatum, secreting the inhibitory transmitter dopamine at their terminal. So that means there is a mutual inhibitory pathway that is maintaining a degree of inhibition of both the areas. Now when you talk about what's happening in Parkinson's disease, there's a destruction of the cells in the substantia nigra that results in the degeneration of the nerve terminals that secrete the dopamine in the neostriatum. There's a normal inhibitory influence of dopamine on the cholinergic neurons that is present in the neostriatum is being significantly diminished and resulting in an overproduction or a relative overactivity of the acetylcholine by the stimulatory neurons. This triggers a chain of abnormal signaling resulting in loss of the control of the muscle movements. So this is usually that's happening in the Parkinson's disease. Now certain drugs can actually induce Parkinson's disease. That is uh, basically uh, the secondary Parkinsonism. Such drugs such as the uh, phenothiazins or haloperidol whose major pharmacological action is the blockade of dopamine receptors in the brain may thereby produce certain Parkinsonian symptoms and hence it is not known as pseudo-Parkinsonism and these drugs therefore should be avoided or used in caution in patients with the Parkinson's disease. Now when you talk about the treatment strategy, so what is the main treatment strategy involved in the Parkinson's disease? In addition to an abundance of inhibited dopaminergic neurons, the striatum is also rich in the excitatory cholinergic neurons that oppose the action of the dopamine. And many of the symptoms of Parkinsonism reflect an imbalance between the excitatory cholinergic neurons and the greatly diminished number of inhibitory and dopaminergic neurons. Therapy is mainly aimed at restoring the dopamine in the basal ganglia and antagonizing the excitatory effect of cholinergic neurons, thus re-establishing the correct dopamine acetylcholine balance. So what are we mainly trying to do? We are trying to increase or restore the dopaminergic action at the same time reducing the or antagonizing the excitatory effect of the cholinergic neurons. So many currently available drugs are mainly aiming to maintain the CNS dopamine levels as constant as possible. And these agents offer temporary relief from the symptoms of the disorder and but they do not just arrest or reverse the neuronal degeneration caused by the disease. First we are going to talk about the levodopa and carbidopa. 
Levodopa is a metabolic precursor of the dopamine and it restores the dopaminergic neurotransmission in the neostriatum by enhancing the synthesis of dopamine in the remaining surviving neurons of the substantia nigra. So in the early disease, the number of residual dopaminergic neurons in the substantia nigra is adequate for conversion of levodopa to dopamine and there is typically about 20% of normal neurons present in the substantia Nigra. Thus, in new patients, the therapeutic response to levodopa is consistent and the patient rarely complains that the drug effects wear off. Unfortunately, as the time progresses, the number of neurons decreases and fewer cells are capable of converting the exogenously administered levodopa to dopamine. And consequently, what happens? There is a fluctuation in the motor control. Relief provided by the levodopa is usually symptomatic and it lasts only while the drug is present in the body. The effects of the levodopa on the CNS can be greatly enhanced by co-administering the carbidopa or dopamine decarboxylase inhibitor that does not cross the blood-brain barrier. So let's talk about the mechanism of action. So what does it do exactly? So we know that levodopa is the precursor of dopamine. So this dopamine as such does not cross the blood-brain barrier, but its immediate precursor levodopa is actively transported into the CNS and gets converted into the dopamine. The levodopa must be administered with the carbidopa. Why? Without the carbidopa, what happens is that much of the drug gets decarboxylated to dopamine in the periphery, resulting in nausea, vomiting, cardiac arrhythmias and hypotension. That means the levodopa in the periphery gets converted to the dopamine by the decarboxylase enzyme and thereby produces dopamine-induced side effects such as nausea, vomiting, cardiac arrhythmias and hypotension. In order to prevent that, we usually administer carbidopa with the levodopa. So what does carbidopa do? It is a dopamine decarboxylase inhibitor that diminishes the metabolism of levodopa in the periphery, thereby increasing the availability of the levodopa to the CNS. So what happens? The peripheral conversion of the levodopa is being blocked or inhibited by the carbidopa. Therefore, the more amount of levodopa is being available in the CNS. The addition of carbidopa lowers the dose of the levodopa needed by 4 to 5 fold and consequently decreases the severity of the side effects arising from the peripherally formed dopamine. Next, what is the therapeutic uses of it? These are levodopa and carbidopa. So this levodopa in combination with the carbidopa is an efficacious drug regimen for the treatment of Parkinson's disease. It decreases the rigidity, tremors and other symptoms of the Parkinsonism. In approximately two-thirds of the patients with Parkinson's disease, levodopa and carbidopa substantially reduces the severity of symptoms for the first few years of the treatment. But the patients typically will experience a decline in response during the third to fifth year of therapy. So that because we have already mentioned the action of levodopa is only found in the surviving cells or neurons of the substantia nigra. So as the disease progresses, more degeneration will occur and thereby the conversion of levodopa to dopamine does not occur as effective as in the early disease. And at the same time, withdrawal from the drug must be done gradually. So what is its pharmacokinetics? So this drug is being absorbed rapidly from the small intestine when empty of food. Levodopa has an extremely short half-life which causes fluctuations in the plasma concentration. This may produce fluctuations in motor response which generally correlate with the plasma concentration of the levodopa or perhaps gives rise to the more troublesome on and off phenomenon in which the motor fluctuations are not related to the plasma levels in a simple way. Motor fluctuations may cause the patients to suddenly lose the normal mobility and experience tremors, cramps and immobility. So the ingestion of meals, particularly that is high in protein, would interfere with the transport of levodopa into the CNS. Hence, the levodopa should be taken on an empty stomach, typically 30 minutes before a meal. Coming to the adverse effect profile of these drugs, 
the peripheral effects include anorexia nausea and vomiting this mainly due to the uh, stimulation of the chemoreceptor trigger zone and tachycardia and ventricular extrasystolus can occur due to the dopaminergic action on the heart hypertension may also develop adrenergic action on the iris will cause the mitriasis and in some individuals the blood dyscariasis and a positive reaction to the combs test are seen saliva and urine are a brownish color because of the melanin pigment produced from the catecholamine oxidation now coming to the cns adverse effects visual and auditory hallucinations and abnormal involuntary movements that is the dyskinesias are usually occurring and these effects are the opposite of the parkinsonian symptoms and reflect overactivity of the dopamine in the basal ganglia levodopa can also cause uh, mood changes depression psychosis and anxiety there are certain interactions observed with these levodopa and carbidopa the vitamin pyridoxin increases the peripheral breakdown of the levodopa and diminishes its effectiveness concomitant administration of levodopa and non selective mau inhibitors such as phenylalanine can produce a hypertensive crisis caused by enhanced catecholamine production that is because the monoamine oxidase enzyme is responsible for the metabolism of the catecholamines so when the mau inhibitors is used the metabolism does not occur and thereby there is an enhanced catecholamine production therefore the concomitant administration of these agents is contraindicated and in many psychotic patients the levodopa exacerbates the symptoms possibly through the build up of central catecholamines cardiac patients should be carefully monitored for the possible development of arrhythmias antipsychotic drugs are generally contraindicated in parkinson's disease because they potentially block dopamine receptors and may augment parkinsonian symptoms However the low doses of atypical antipsychotics are sometimes used to treat the levodopa induced psychotic symptoms. Next we're going to talk about the monoamine oxidase inhibitors used in the treatment of Parkinson's disease. That is selagilin and rasagilin. Selagilin also called as deprenyl selectively inhibits the monoamine oxidase type B that is responsible for the metabolism of dopamine at low to moderate doses. and remember it does not inhibit the mao type a which is responsible for metabolizing the norepinephrine and serotonin unless it is given above the recommended doses where it loses its selectivity by decreasing the metabolism of dopamine selagilin increases the dopamine levels in the brain when selagilin is administered with levodopa it enhances the action of levodopa and substantially reduces the required dose Unlike the non-selective mao inhibitors selagilin at recommended doses has little potential for causing hypertensive crisis however the drug loses selectivity at high doses and there is a risk for severe hypertension selagilin is metabolized to methamphetamine and amphetamine whose stimulating properties may produce insomnia if the drug is administered later than mid afternoon Rasagilin an irreversible and selective inhibitor of the brain mao type B has 5 times the potency of selagilin and unlike the selagilin rasagilin is not metabolized to an amphetamine like substance next moving on to catechol o methyl transferase inhibitors so normally the methylation of levodopa by catechol o methyl transferase to 3 o methyl dopa is a minor pathway for levodopa metabolism in the periphery So however when peripheral dopamine decarboxylase activity is inhibited by carbidopa a significant concentration of 3 o methyl dopa is formed that competes with levodopa for active transport into the cns endocapon and tocapon selectively and reversibly inhibits the compt inhibition of compt by these agents leads to decreased plasma concentrations of 3 o methyl dopa and increased central uptake of levodopa and greater concentration of brain dopamine both of these agents reduce the symptoms of varying of phenomena seen in patients on levodopa and carbidopa combination and these two drugs differ primarily in their pharmacokinetic and adverse effect profiles 
So talking about its pharmacokinetics, the oral absorption of both drugs occurs readily and is not influenced by the food. They are extensively bound to the plasma albumin with a limited volume of distribution. Torcapone has a relatively long duration of action probably due to its affinity for the enzyme compared to the endocapone which requires more frequent dosing. And both these drugs are extensively metabolized and eliminated in fecus and urine. The dosage may need to be adjusted in patients with moderate or severe cirrhosis. And both the drugs exhibit adverse effects that are observed in patients taking the levodopa carbidopa combination including diarrhea, postural hypertension, nausea, anorexia, dyskinesias, hallucinations and sleep disorders. More seriously, fulminating hepatic necrosis is associated with the talcopone use. Therefore, it should be used along with appropriate hepatic function monitoring only in patients in whom other modalities have failed. And endocapone does not exhibit this toxicity and has largely replaced the tall capo. Next, we are going to talk about the dopamine receptor agonist. This group of anti-Parkinsonian compounds includes bromocryptin, an ergo derivative, then non-ergo drugs such as ropinirole, pramiprexol, rotigotin, and the newer agent apomorphine. These agents have a longer duration of action than that of levodopa and are effective in patients exhibiting fluctuations in response to levodopa. Initially, the therapy with these drugs is associated with less risk of developing dyskinesias and motor fluctuation as compared to patients started on levodopa. Bromocryptin, pramiprexol and ropinirole are effective in patients with Parkinson's disease complicated by motor fluctuations and dyskinesias. However, these drugs are ineffective in patients who have not responded to levodopa. Apomorphin is an injectable dopamine agonist that is used in severe and advanced stages of the disease to supplement the oral medications. Side effects severely limit the utility of the dopamine agonist. Bromocryptin, the actions of this ergo derivative are similar to those of the levodopa except that hallucinations, confusion, delirium, nausea and orthostatic hypertension are more common whereas dyskinesia is less prominent. In psychiatric illness, bromocryptin may cause the mental condition to worsen. It should be used with caution in patients with a history of myocardial infarction or peripheral vascular disease. Because bromocryptin is an ergo derivative, it has the potential to cause the pulmonary and retroperitoneal fibrosis. Now talking about the non-ergo derivatives, that is apomorphin, pramiprexol, ropinirole and rotigotin that are approved for the treatment of Parkinson's disease, the pramiprexol and ropinirole are orally active agents whereas apomorphin and rotigotin are available in injectable and transdermal delivery systems respectively. Apomorphin is used for acute management of the hypomobility of phenomenon in advanced Parkinson's disease. Rotigotin is administered as a once daily transdermal patch that provides even drug levels over 24 hours. These agents elevate the motor deficits in patients who have never taken levodopa and also in patients with advanced Parkinson's disease who are treated with levodopa. Dopamine agonists may delay the need to use levodopa in early Parkinson's disease and may decrease the dose of levodopa in advanced Parkinson's disease. Unlike the ergotamine derivatives, these agents do not exacerbate peripheral vascular disorders or cause fibrosis. Nausea, hallucinations, insomnia, dizziness, constipation and orthostatic hypertension are among the most distressing side effects of these drugs but dyskinesias are less frequent than with levodopa. Pramiprexol is mainly excreted unchanged in the urine and the dosage adjustments are needed in renal dysfunction. Simitidin inhibits the renal tubular secretion of organic bases and may significantly increase the half-life of pramiprexol. The 
next drug that is used in the treatment of the Parkinson's disease is amantadin, which was a antiviral drug that is used to treat the influenza, which was accidentally discovered to have an anti-Parkinsonian action. Amantadin has several effects on a number of neurotransmitters implicated in Parkinsonism including increasing the release of dopamine, blocking cholinergic receptors and inhibiting the N-methyl, D-aspartate type of glutamate receptors and the current evidence supports action at NMDA receptors as the primary action at therapeutic concentrations. And remember, if dopamine release is already at a maximum, amantadin has no effect. The drug may cause restlessness, agitation, confusion and hallucinations and at high doses it may induce acute toxic psychosis. Orthostatic hypertension, urinary retention, peripheral edema and dry mouth also may occur. Amantadin is less efficacious than levodopa and tolerance develops more readily. However, it has fewer side effects. Antimascarinic agents is the last class of drugs that can be used in the treatment of Parkinson's disease which are much less efficacious than levodopa and play only an adjuvant role in anti-Parkinsonism therapy. The actions of benztropin, trihexyphenidyl, procycladin and bipyridin are similar although individual patients may respond more favorably to one drug. Blockage of cholinergic transmission produces effects similar to augmentation of dopaminergic transmission since it helps to correct the imbalance in the dopamine acetylcholine ratio. These agents can induce mood changes and produce xerostomia that is the dryness of the mouth then it can cause constipation visual problems typical of muscarinic blockers. They interfere with the gastrointestinal peristalsis and are contraindicated in patients with glaucoma, prostatic hyperplasia or pyloric stenosis. So that is all about the treatment of the Parkinson's disease. So in this video we have learned about what is Parkinson's disease, what is the possible etiology and patho of the Parkinson's disease and the different treatment strategies used which includes the levodopa and carbidopa. Then we have used the MAO inhibitors, COMT inhibitors, dopamine receptor agonist, amantadin and antimascarinic agents. So if there's any doubts, comments and suggestions, please do mail in us. Thank you.